Peter, who had a pattern of verbally mistreating me and exerting control over my actions, was unfaithful to me. During a trip with his mistress, they were both involved in an accident. When I visited him after the accident, Peter shockingly expressed his belief that I wouldn't care for him now that he was paralyzed from the waist down. He arrogantly assumed I would look after both him and his mistress, Emily, suggesting she could decide on home decor while I should simply follow their directives. Peter criticized me for treating his wife merrily as a housekeeper, which ignited a deep anger within me, especially recalling a time when he didn't lift a finger to help me while I was injured. My name is Mary, a 48-year-old who thought she married a hardworking and honest man named Peter. After marrying, he revealed his domineering personality. Despite my reservations, the bond between Peter and his son, Arthur, from a previous relationship, touched me deeply. Arthur treated me with the love of a real mother, and their close relationship was something I cherished, leading me to hope for a change in Peter. Three years into our marriage, when Arthur started fifth grade, I began considering employment to fill my increasing free time and contribute financially, inspired by other mothers working to support their children's education. I suggested to Peter the idea of taking a part-time job, but he reacted furiously, misunderstanding my intentions as a critique of his earnings. I tried to explain my desire to help save for Arthur's future education and our retirement, but Peter took offense, viewing my wish to work as an attack on his status as a provider and his public image. He even accused me of infidelity, sidetracking our discussion from its original focus on securing our family's financial future to baseless accusations and personal insecurities. Peter seemed trapped in an outdated mindset, unable to accept the idea of a partnership in both household responsibilities and financial contributions. I was in perfect health, and our son Arthur was no longer a young child requiring constant care. Hearing about other mothers embarking on new careers stirred a sense of longing within me. However, Peter dismissed these aspirations with a dismissive attitude, suggesting that I wouldn't be capable of managing both a job and household duties due to my supposed inefficiency at home. He was adamant that sharing the household chores was out of the question, equating my desire for a job with an unreasonable demand on him. Peter's stance was clear. He viewed the idea of him helping with housework as inappropriate, insisting that maintaining the home was solely my responsibility so he could concentrate on his career. Frustrated by his inflexible perspective, I eventually dropped the subject, resigning myself to continue as a full-time housewife. However, a few years later, an accident while cycling to the supermarket led to a fractured arm, rendering me unable to perform my usual household tasks. Arthur, now a senior in high school, offered his support, but Peter's reaction was far from sympathetic. He saw my injury as an inconvenience to him, insisting that I should still be able to fulfill my duties as a housewife. Despite my physical limitations and doctor's orders, Peter's concern was for his own comfort, not my well-being. This incident highlighted Peter's selfishness and lack of empathy, as he begrudgingly accepted the temporary disruption to his routines without offering any genuine support. His reaction to my injury and his overall attitude towards our marriage reflected a deep-seated arrogance and disregard for my contributions to our family. As time passed, my suspicions about Peter's infidelity grew, particularly when he announced a business trip over a long weekend with unusual enthusiasm. His behavior, increased overtime, heightened attention to his appearance, secretive phone use, suggested this business trip was likely an escapade with his mistress. His excited preparations and transparent lies only confirmed my suspicions, revealing the depth of his deceit and the fragility of our marital bond. While Peter was planning a seemingly enjoyable outing with a client, his eagerness to dine out and a conveniently placed New York guidebook betrayed his true intentions. This display of carelessness pushed me to a decision point. After using his fingerprint to unlock his phone while he slept, I discovered undeniable evidence of his affair, texts and photos exchanged with his mistress, planning deceitful escapades under the guise of business trips. Despite the clarity of his betrayal, I hesitated to confront him immediately, wanting to avoid causing distress to our son Arthur before his crucial exams. I aimed to collect irrefutable proof, such as photographs of Peter with his mistress, to strengthen my case for divorce. However, amidst these tumultuous plans, a call from the emergency center disrupted everything. Learning of Peter's accident and his serious condition elicited a complex mix of emotions. Despite the fading of my love for him, 
concern, and a sense of responsibility surged within me. I quickly gathered essentials for his hospital stay and rushed to his side. The sight of him, injured and vulnerable, was jarring, and the prognosis of potential paralysis from a spinal cord injury deepened the complexity of our situation. Confronted with the reality of his condition, I encountered a police officer at the hospital who inadvertently confirmed my suspicions about the identity of Peter's passenger at the time of the accident. The presence of his mistress in this crisis was a bitter revelation, yet it did not erase the shock and concern for Peter's well-being. As Peter underwent surgery and faced a future of partial paralysis, the logistical and emotional implications began to weigh on me. The necessity of remodeling our home to accommodate his disability, alongside the prospect of him working from home, presented a new set of challenges. Despite the enormity of his betrayal, the immediate need to address his health and rehabilitation took precedence. The situation forced a re-evaluation of my feelings and plans. The idea of pursuing a divorce in the wake of such a life-altering event felt increasingly complicated. My visit to the hospital, after two months of separation, revealed a man who, despite his physical limitations, appeared unexpectedly optimistic about his recovery. This encounter left me grappling with the implications of care, responsibility, and the unresolved issues between us casting a shadow of doubt over my next steps. Upon my intention to leave after delivering Peter's clothes, he surprisingly invited me for a coffee as a gesture of gratitude. Initially hesitant, his offer struck me as odd, possibly a change induced by his recent accident. However, the true reason became apparent when we reached the lounge. There, Peter and a woman, both in wheelchairs, awaited us. This woman, Emily, greeted Peter warmly, revealing their close relationship. Their interaction left little doubt about her identity as his mistress, or so I thought. As they shared a tender embrace, Peter suggested that I would be responsible for taking care of both him and Emily post-discharge, a notion that both shocked and offended me. His audacity was further, amplified when he and Emily began discussing interior decoration preferences as if I had agreed to their presumptuous plan. My frustration peaked when Peter dismissed my role to merely that of a caretaker, ignoring the lack of support I received from him when I was injured. I was ready to reject their absurd request outright when Peter clarified Emily's identity, introducing her as the wife of his manager, not his mistress. This revelation was accompanied by Emily's polite greeting, which did little to dispel my skepticism. Peter attempted to dispel the misunderstanding by explaining his platonic relationship with Emily, citing their age difference and her preference for older men as evidence against the accusation of an affair. Despite his efforts to justify their relationship as purely adversary, particularly concerning personal trueblis, his past behavior made his Daniel difficult to believe. Emily's reaction, suggesting jealousy on my part, only added insult to injury, especially given Peter's historical indifference to my own concerns. Their explanation of how the accident occurred, a mere coincidence born from an impromptu meeting, did little to assuage my doubts, given Peter's talent for deception. This encounter not only highlighted Peter's knack for manipulation, but also underscored the complexity of navigating trust and betrayal within our strained relationship. In a conversation that quickly spiraled into confrontation, Emily suggested she felt reassured at the prospect of being cared for by me, Peter's wife, which I immediately contested. Emily's insinuation that my role as a caretaker for Peter's son, who is not biologically related to me, somehow obligated me to extend the same care to her, was both mocking and misplaced. Peter, joining in, implied that my decade of support obligated me to care for him, and, by extension, Emily as well. Their logic was baffling, pushing me to the edge of my patience. I called out the absurdity of their explanation, demanding honesty about their affair, which they both denied until I presented incontrovertible evidence from Peter's phone. Peter's reaction to my discovery, accusing me of violating privacy, was ironic considering the circumstances. His attempt to diminish my role in Arthur's life, despite my significant emotional investment, struck a deep chord. Amid this heated exchange, the arrival of Mr. Jonathan, Emily's husband and Peter's manager, in a hospital bed added a dramatic twist. His sudden appearance, along with the revelation that he was the victim of the accident, caused by Peter, unveiled a complex web of deceit. Mr. Jonathan's casual demeanor and his decision not to inform Peter of his presence suggested a planned confrontation. 
The dynamics shifted dramatically with Mr. Jonathan's involvement, revealing that the accident was more than a simple mishap. It was a collision that involved significant figures in our lives. Peter's unawareness of the full extent of the accident and the identities involved highlighted a profound disconnect and deception between him and Emily. Mr. Jonathan's arrival not only clarified the accident's circumstances, but also exposed the intricate relationships and secrets that bound us all, setting the stage for a tense and uncertain resolution. In the unfolding drama, Emily's frustration boiled over as she confronted Peter, revealing the complexities of their affair and the consequent accident. She bitterly recounted how she had informed Peter at the time of the accident that the car he crashed into belonged to her husband, yet he failed to grasp the significance until it was too late. Emily's fury was palpable as she blamed Peter for ruining her life, highlighting the physical and emotional toll the accident had taken on her. The revelation that her husband had threatened to demand a hefty sum as compensation for the affair added another layer of tension. Peter's realization of the mess he had caused was met with a mix of fear and regret, prompting him to offer a settlement in hopes of mitigating the fallout. However, Mr. Jonathan's entrance, with a smirk, signaled his intention to capitalize on the situation, demanding compensation for the affair, medical expenses, and the damaged luxury car, all while mocking Peter's expired insurance and reckless driving. Emily's scathing critique of Peter, juxtaposing their relationship against the backdrop of his pride and the mundane aspects of their affair, laid bare the superficiality and recklessness that had led to their current predicament. She spared no feelings criticizing the quality of their outings and expressing disdain for Peter's boastful nature, particularly regarding his son's supposed potential. My response to the unfolding debacle was sharp and immediate. I condemned the audacity of expecting me to care for Peter's mistress amidst this chaos, highlighting the absurdity and cruelty of such a request. Peter's feeble attempt to salvage his relationship with Emily, even as she firmly rejected him, underscored his delusional grasp of the situation. Emily's parting words to me were a mix of pity and disdain, pointing out the humiliation I had endured at Peter's behest. Her decision to live independently, coupled with her resolve to cut ties with both Peter and myself, marked a decisive end to her involvement in our lives, leaving behind a trail of revelations and recriminations that would not be easily forgotten. After expressing her demands, Emily skillfully navigated her wheelchair back to her room, leaving behind a clear message for Peter about the financial repercussions of his actions. As the situation in the lounge began to dissipate, Peter, fueled by anger and a sense of betrayal, lamented Emily's change of heart post-accident and desperately sought my support, claiming the bond of marriage as his leverage. However, my patience had reached its limit. I presented Peter with divorce papers, no longer willing to postpone the inevitable due to the impending exams or any other reason. Peter's shock at my decision quickly turned into spite, accusing me of selfishness despite his years of neglect and verbal abuse. His reminder of his support over the years only served to reignite my resolve, highlighting his hypocrisy and lack of empathy towards me, especially during my times of need. Peter's attempt to justify his lack of care by blaming my previous injury on my own carelessness was met with a cold reflection of his current predicament. His reluctant agreement to sign the divorce papers marked the end of our tumultuous marriage, with a bitter exchange of words about the finality of our separation. The tension escalated with Arthur's unexpected entrance, confronting Peter about the misuse of his college savings. Peter's nonchalant admission and justification of his actions underscored his selfishness and disregard for Arthur's future. His entitlement and lack of accountability were appalling, even suggesting that Arthur should take care of him post-divorce. The revelation of my significant inheritance from my late aunt shifted the power dynamics dramatically. Arthur's inadvertent disclosure and my subsequent announcement of my financial independence, coupled with my intent to seek alimony, left Peter scrambling to salvage his dignity. Despite his attempts to appeal to Arthur for future support, the damage was done. Arthur's rejection of his father's plea for care, in light of the financial betrayal, was a defining moment, showcasing a newfound resolve and independence from Peter's manipulative grasp. Arthur firmly declared his intention to attend an out-of-state college, dismissing Peter's expectation for him to follow in his footsteps to his alma mater. Peter's surprise at this revelation underscored his disconnection from his son's life and decisions, 
a divide widened by his preoccupations with his affair rather than his family's needs. Peter defensively insisted he had always prioritized his family despite evidence to the contrary, including the misuse of savings for his affair. His attempts to justify his actions fell flat in the face of Arthur's blunt criticism of his treatment towards me, highlighting a long-standing pattern of neglect and disrespect that had marred their family dynamics. Arthur's perspective revealed a deep-seated resentment towards Peter's behavior, contrasting sharply with the warmth and care he received from me, his stepmother. He openly questioned Peter's harshness towards me, despite the love and support I provided, challenging the very foundation of their marriage. In a striking rejection of Peter's expectation for familial support, Arthur made it clear that his loyalty and affection lay solely with me, not with a father who had consistently prioritized his own desires over his family's well-being. This moment of clarity from Arthur marked a turning point, leaving Peter isolated and confronted with the consequences of his actions. The aftermath saw Peter grappling with the fallout of his choices, including a divorce initiated by me and Arthur's decision to cut ties. Faced with significant financial obligations, Peter's desperation led him to seek leniency from his boss, only to find his professional life tainted by the scandal of his affair. The rapid spread of rumors and the resulting ostracization from his workplace and family underscored the extent of his fall from grace. Meanwhile, Emily's path post-divorce involved a move to independence, albeit reluctantly, as she adjusted to a new life in a rented apartment and a job in computing. This shift represented a fresh start for both Emily and me, as we navigated our lives beyond the shadow of Peter's betrayals, each finding our own way forward amidst the challenges left in the wake of his actions. Emily had always needed help during the day, but her challenging behavior made it hard for caregivers to stick around. Eventually, she was left with only those who were unkind, making her days filled with tears and scolding. After parting ways with Peter, I managed to use the money left from my aunt's inheritance and the divorce settlement to support Arthur's college expenses. With what was left, I bought myself an apartment and started enjoying my newfound independence. I no longer had to worry about household tasks being critiqued or how I looked in public. I even went back to a part-time job after a decade. My days are now busy yet rewarding. Peter, hearing about how I was getting on, sent me a mocking message, suggesting I must be lonely and hinting he should visit for old times' sake, even asking for money as a thanks for his imagined support. I immediately blocked him. Despite this, he somehow got my address from Arthur and turned up uninvited. I had no choice but to call the police, which resulted in his arrest after a formal complaint. It turns out he had been bothering Emily too, which enraged his brother when he had to collect Peter from the station. Now, Peter is confined to his home, spending his days online to pay off his debts. Meanwhile, Arthur, learning from his father's mistakes, is fully committed to his studies and enjoying his college life. Although we're not related by blood, I consider Arthur like my own son and am dedicated to supporting him and watching him grow.